Hello campers, I'm Kevin Savitz, and this is a special episode of Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. Today, we're going to camp, Atari Computer Camp. In 1982 and 1983, Atari ran camps for kids aged 10 to 16 years old. So I really wanted to go to one of these camps when I was a kid. I saw the ad in some computer magazine or probably the article in Antic, and I asked my mom and she said no. Computers were toys, and especially Atari computers. They were just video games. So I got to go to summer camps and they were fun but they weren't computer camps. Poor me, right? So, I mean, I would have been the perfect age. I was born in 1971, so the, f- the first year was 82. I would have been 11, and uh, I probably heard about this in 83. When I would have been 12, I was right I was right there in the zone, and I was ready for camp, and, and uh, it didn't work out for me. Well, now that it's summer 2015, and I was still wondering what wonders I missed at the Atari computer camps. So I put together this special episode where we can learn about them together. 1982 was the first year for Atari computer camps, which were held at three locations. Uh, Camp Atari San Diego was at the uh, University of San Diego in California. Camp Atari Asheville at the Asheville School in Asheville, North Carolina and Camp Atari East Stroudsburg at East Stroudsburg State College in Pennsylvania. Camp was canceled at the fourth announced site, Camp Atari Sheboygan, at Lakeland College in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. There would be two two two-week sessions at each of those locations. InfoWorld magazine wrote that the camps were the first such effort by a major computer manufacturer. The second year of Atari Camps, 1983, was the biggest. It was held at seven locations and expanded to four two-week sessions. Some kids stayed for all eight weeks. Camp Atari East Stroudsburg in Pennsylvania was renamed to Camp Atari Poconos. Wow, that sounds fancier. And the San Diego Camp at University of San Diego was renamed to Camp Atari Pacific, also fancier. The Asheville, North Carolina location was moved to University of North Carolina at Asheville and renamed Camp Atari's Smoky Mountains. Plus, they added new locations. Uh, Camp Atari New England at the Stonely Burnham School in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Camp Atari Chesapeake at the Oldsfield School in Glencoe, Maryland. Camp Atari Midwest at the Shattuck School in Faribault, Minnesota, and Camp Atari Old West at the Athenian School in Danville, California. In 1984, Atari was imploding financially, and the camps were no longer a priority for the company. Bob Kahn, the director, told me that camp that year was canceled. But Michael Curran's Atari timeline says that the camps were held at the New England and East Stroudsburg locations. I'm unclear about whether the camps actually happened that year. In July 1982, the Today Show ran a segment about Atari computer camps. You can see it on YouTube and archive.org. There's a link in the show notes at ataripodcast.com. I'm going to play the audio of the four-minute segment now. In it, they interview Bob Kahn, director of all the Atari camps, who we'll hear from later. On Lifestyle this morning, Nancy Foreman checks in with part four in our series on summer camps. Well, Brian, this summer seems to be full of special interest camps, including the one I visited, Camp Atari. be Summer Camp USA. Volleyball, swimming, checkers, strumming a guitar. But at Camp Atari in Asheville, North Carolina, summer also sounds like this. What we're going to talk about is the command called match. 
All right. Now, what happens when the computer executes an accept command with a, with a string variable? Well, there's something called an input buffer. Don't worry about the name. What it is, is it's like a little box. And what it's going to do is it's going to look at each one of those character strings and sees if it matches the input buffer. That's not a foreign language, but it might as well be. It's called Pilot, one of several computer formats taught and spoken here. We want our children here to have a romance with computers. It's kind of a, a romantic notion. Uh, what we mean by that is, uh, rather than just teaching kids um, a programming language or teaching the kids what's inside the computer, we want the kids to experience what it's like to make the computer do something that's interesting to them. Our curriculum is broad enough so that kids who are interested in graphics can do that. Kids who are interested in using the computer as a tool for manipulating data can do that. But what do they learn from seeing a graphic emerge from the screen? What it applies to often enough is that that machine there is a reflection of what's going on in your mind. You've designed a process, a step by step, a little at a time, you've made a computer do something that you've been planning, you've made a design here, it's like storyboarding almost for a movie. And it's almost as a strange kind of intelligence sitting there on the other side of that television screen staring back at you, but that's your own intelligence. Uh, that's your program. How does this process change their thinking? You begin to learn about how your own learning process works. You begin to see yourself uh, as a problem solver. You, uh, you begin to learn uh, how to become a learner. And there can't be a higher goal in education than to uh, learn about your own learning process. See, we're used to having computers with the X, Y axis up here, but Pilot has it down here and we're not used to that so we we had to figure out how double negatives worked um usually at home i program about six hours a day what do you get out of it it's fun you get the pleasure of seeing your program run then after you get a complex thing like this done it is really a nice feeling it's a challenge to do it mm -hmm. how did you get started i've always bugged my parents for a computer and now i've gotten one and what did they get you? An Atari 800 with uh, 24K of memory to start with. It took a while for me to understand it all, but once you get started, there's no stopping you. Really? Do your parents uh, understand this? Are, are they involved nope. in it? No? They do not know a single thing about the computers, except how to sell them. It is the technology of today. It's not just in the future anymore. And it's, it's well for parents to start thinking about what's this all about. Uh, and it does require that, that you spend some time to, to interact with it and learn what it can do. There will soon be more family computer camps where kids and parents can learn together. And guess who will probably learn the fastest? We'll be back after these messages. I'm sure a lot of people learned about Atari computer camps from the Today Show, which was a national venue for uh, the general public. But if you already knew about Atari computers, chances are you read about the camps in one of the Atari magazines. Atari Connection magazine, a, a marketing arm of Atari, did a breathless article about the camps in its September 1982 issue. The October 1983 issue of Antic magazine talked about the happenings at the camp's second year. Ironically, getting kids and parents excited about it long after summer had ended, and long before the third year of camps would be canceled. I'm going to quote from large parts of the article. It's called Computer Camp, Report from the Old West by Deborah Burns. It's in the October 1983 issue of Antic. There'll be a link in the show notes to the complete article. On a bright and sunny day in August, Antic paid a visit to Camp Atari, Old West, 40 miles east of San Francisco, on the slopes of Mount Diablo. From June 25th to August 19th, about 96 campers were admitted to each two-week session of the Atari camps. Campers pay $890 for a session and $425 for each additional week. For those who plan to stay the entire eight weeks, the cost is $2,999. The average enrollment at the Danville camp fluctuated from 85 to 60, while the number of kids who wanted to attend the Poconos site doubled from 80 last year to 160 this year. One out of five campers is a girl. Once a week on banquet night, a special guest speaker, usually a computer game designer or programmer, appears to talk about his work. 
The week before our visit, Chris Crawford, author of Atari's Eastern Front, talked about his programming experience and his new games, soon to be released, called Gossip and Excalibur. The day we visited the camp, Vince Wu, designer of the famous Donkey Kong arcade game, was scheduled to speak. Computer classrooms are equipped with a million dollars of equipment, and there are three classrooms with 12 Atari computer systems each. At maximum enrollment, there are two students per computer. The students are divided into separate work groups according to interest and skill level. In the second classroom we visited, campers were learning Advanced Basic and Pilot. Dan Zimmerman, the instructor in that class, told us that they were field testing the new Atari Pilot in disk form. When they're not dining or computing, the campers have many other activities to choose. Swimmers have an Olympic-sized swimming pool, and an official Red Cross water safety course is offered. A huge gym for basketball is available. Skipping ahead to a quote, We also had a whole group playing Dungeons & Dragons, said Marlene. Not on the computer, but the original game. One of the counselors really knows that game and played Dungeon Master. I think that goes along with the kind of child who comes here. I want to take a minute to mention something about the pilot language mentioned in that article. Dan Zimmerman, the instructor of the class, told us that they were field testing the new Atari pilot in disk form. Indeed, the second year of the camp's advanced curriculum included programming an Atari Super Pilot. The language was announced in the Atari catalogs, but was never released to the general public. The only people who ever saw this language were the campers that second year at Atari camp. In the meantime, the language was thought to be lost. No one had seen it, it had been in some catalogs, and that was it. But Atari's director of special projects, Bob Kahn, he had a copy and sent it to me along with two giant boxes of course material for the camps. So now Super Pilot and all the documentation and just about everything else from the camps has been digitized and is available at archive.org. All right, so it's time to hear from some campers, but first I have to tell you a story. In December 2014, I bought something on eBay, an Atari Computer Camp's coursework binder with a lovely line drawing of an Atari 800 on the cover. The seller's description says there was courseware, diskettes, and worksheets in the binder. The worksheets were nothing special at all, just some standard Atari basic reference pages. There was a diskette of sample software for campers. It's online at archive.org now, along with the entire camp curriculum. But the best thing in the binder, I think, was handwritten notes from its owner. Just a few loose leaf sheets. One listed stuff to pack in mom's handwriting, 16 pairs of socks, 13 pairs of underwear, four pairs of jeans, two sweatpants, and so on. Another, in a kid's handwriting, was a penciled map of the United States being bombarded with missiles fired from submarines offshore. Global thermonuclear war is written above it in kind of an LED handwriting font thing. War Games had just come out in June 1983. But my favorite pages are the ones with the names and addresses of friends that this camper made, presumably so they could keep in touch after camp got out. Sean in Valencia, California. Dave in Stamford, Connecticut. Kelly and Megan, sisters from Barrington, Illinois. Joel from Carefree, Arizona. Kids from all over who came to geek out at Atari camp. So I wrote to them all. I sent a thick pile of letters to all the dresses where those kids used to live. Yes, most of their families had probably moved away long ago, but I gave it a shot. I wrote, I know this is out of the blue, but I believe that Matt may have attended an Atari computer camp in the early 1980s. If that's the case, I would love to interview you over the phone about his experience at the camp for an episode we're doing all about Atari summer camps. So if this letter manages to find its way to you, I really appreciate hearing from you. Of the 15 letters I mailed, three weren't deliverable. Most got no reply at all. But then I got one reply from a camper's mom. Peggy wrote, I'm not sure I ever got back to you in January when you sent a letter to me regarding my son, Mark, having attended the Atari computer camp in the 80s. Yes, he was the one. It must have done him a lot of good because he eventually invented and marketed something that was a first for the telephone companies years ago. 
and that put him on the road in communications that continue in other ways to this day. Peggy, the proud mom, saves some things from Mark's childhood, including the receipt from his Atari camp, $890, and his acceptance letter. In all caps, it said, It is with great pleasure that we welcome you to the wonderful world of Atari computer camps. We will make every effort to ensure you will have a camp experience that lasts a lifetime. But best of all, she saved two letters that Mark mailed from camp. So, and I really love this, we get to hear from a camper who wrote this from camp. Here's letter number one, dated August 7, 1983. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm having a good time here. It is not quite what I expected, but it's okay, and the food is not too bad either. The weather has been pretty hot, and there's been a lot of thunder and lightning storms. We got the Atari shirts free today. Everyone gets them. They have all the games here in the library, and most kids bring theirs. I've already got Donkey Kong, and tell Tracy I also have pole position. Tomorrow, I'm going to try to get Sam, the speech synthesizer. I have to write the letter or else I don't get to eat tomorrow. I will also write to you on Thursdays. Love, Mark. And here's letter number two, which is undated. Dear Mom and Dad, Still having a pretty good time down here. Last night, it rained, and today, very humid. The air, really sticky. Computer class is pretty much fun. I got some more games, and at the end of this week, we hope to get Moon Patrol and possible even the new Star Wars game that we saw in the arcade. I can get any APX game I want. Tell Tracy that there's a new game called Dallas after the TV series. We hope to get an early version of it. In my last letter, which I hope you got, I said we had to write on Monday and Thursdays. Well, we have to write Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Tonight, we're going to see the last episode of M.A.S.H., which I have already seen anyway. Well, I hope to hear from you soon, and I hope you're having a good time, because I am. Sorry the letters are sloppy. Love, Mark. Okay, back to the camp binder that I got from eBay. Another one of the names on the handwritten loose-leaf paper was Dave from Stamford, Connecticut. I found Dave Dresden on Twitter, and I got to interview him. Dave is half of Gabriel and Dresden, a trance electronica music duo. Dave was an Atari camper twice at East Stroudsburg State College, Pennsylvania in 1982 and San Diego in 1983. This interview took place May 15, 2015. It was, it was an interesting time because it was like personal computing was like this whole new thing that was, you know, about to take over the world and uh, I went uh, to uh, Atari Computer Camp in Stroudsburg in 1982, I think it was. Mm-hmm. And um, and and I and I come to find out that like literally a kid that lives two miles down the road from me uh, is also there. So we, uh, you know, we bonded over computers and basic language programming, and you know, we made a summer out of it, and it was really awesome, and we were friends for a long time. Um, awesome. But uh, him and I got into some things that our parents weren't so thrilled about (laughs) Um, (laughs) in terms of like, you know, back in the days of bulletin board systems, we would, you know, hack into MCI and sprint codes with like a a freaker program and get codes so that we could call bulletin board systems all over the world. And this is something that we kind of got the seeds for doing at Atari computer camp, (laughs) you know, because, because hacking is, you know, it's a part of the tech, you know, the tech technology industry. And, you know, we were, you know, very similar. And, you know, we were trying to figure out how to, like, break the system so that we could do what we wanted to do. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's the one thing I really remember about that, because, um, uh, about that year. And then the next year, uh, we both went out to the San Diego one uh-huh. uh, in 1983, and and that was amazing. I mean, it was just like a good group of kids that were really into computers, and you know, we like were all talking to each other like true nerds. And it was the counselors were were great, and the 
the computer labs were very informative and they got to, they let us, you know, use the computers, at, you know, at all hours of the day and night, pretty much the great place. I, I, you know, it's been 31 years now, yeah. 32 years now. And I still like, you know, remember it vividly. How'd you find out about it? Do you remember it was like in a magazine? Did you ask your parents and they were just like, you know, what they think of it? I think it was probably compute magazine, mm-hmm. you know, uh, every early, you know, personal computer geek, you know, from, you know, Atari, Apple, and Commodore 64, they would, uh, and TRS-80, mm-hmm. they all, uh, you know, subscribed to Compute Magazine. And I think that they probably had an advertisement in there. Yeah. And my parents saw that I was, you know, really into personal computing. And so when I suggested it to them, they said, sure, absolutely. Um, I think that because my dad has always been tech savvy and he knew that, Computers are going to be thing they needed to know about in the future. Yeah. So they supported it. You know, in the beginning, they supported <laughs> my love of, you know, using computers. So did you have a computer at home before you went to camp? Oh yeah, I had an Atari 800. Uh huh. Um, and I ha- I had held on to that because I love playing video games. And let's face it, the Atari 800 was pretty much the best video game machine. In 1982, yeah, uh, even even better than the Apple II, I think. But uh, you know, we all, we also like to used to make our own games uh, with basic language, and we were pretty proficient at it. Um, we made a few things uh, that you know we traded on the bulletin board system that got you know a little bit of traction on them. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, we had to like you know, transfer into machine language because we didn't know how to speak machine language. (laughs) Can you paint me a picture of what you were doing day to day and how much computer time were you doing and did they make you play tennis and how late, you know, (laughs) were you up to no good? I remember it was, I was never unhappy. And I was a kid that got bored easily and like uh, couldn't focus on anything. But like when I went to computer camp, it was like I was just so interested in it all because it was just it was just such a new and exciting world. Um, and I love I, video games was my like absolute favorite thing to do. Video games and listening to music. So <laughs> I ended up going into music, but I probably could have been a, a computer programmer or a video game designer, or, you know, maybe even yeah. an app developer had I stuck with it. But I went, I moved towards music. Um, but day to day, you know, we had like, you know, there was a morning lab where you'd like talk about some aspect of the language, you know, because like, all these different kids were d- learning different things. So it's like you had the Fortran class over here and you had the, uh, and you didn't, you could go to the ones you wanted. You didn't, it wasn't mandatory. You could totally like just hang out in your dorm all day if you wanted to, but, um, you, you just sort of found the click and the thing that you wanted to do and you just went with it. It was very structured within kind of being not very structured. Like once you were in it, you like became friends with everybody in the room and you guys talked about theories and how to, how to do things outside the computer class. And, you know, you could go and sign up and use the computers pretty much, you know, until like 10 o'clock at night too if you wanted to go out and work something out on the computers you know some kids actually brought computers with them to camp so they had a computer in their you know in their dorm room I wasn't one of the lucky ones like that <laughs> and those were the kids that always had their door closed because they were doing some crazy stuff in there probably <laughs> computer wise no I don't know it didn't seem like anybody was partying or using drugs or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I figured. I mean, these were computer nerds. They probably were uh, more interested in coding than, you know, totally. Whatever. I mean, it, yeah, coding and whatever, you know, it wasn't the code like today. I mean, the, today's code is just absolutely crazy. I couldn't even get my head around it. But that's just because I didn't follow that, you know, that path in life. Yeah, right. So yeah, do you, do you think that the uh, the Atari computers help get pu- push you in the direction that that, that you went of doing uh, electronic music now? Oh, absolutely. I mean, 
when I was making music in the 90s, I mean, we were doing it all on Atari computers yeah. and Notator. And because uh, they were really good with, for, you know, audio applications, um, you know, because they had really good processing power. Um, is there anything else that I haven't asked you about the, the camps that uh, that I should have? I remember, uh, I mean, for me, it was actually going to San Diego in 1983. Mm-hmm. Uh, really changed my life musically because they had this radio station there that played this music that I'd never heard before. Mm. And it really changed my world because, you know, we didn't have that on the East Coast, all the new wave music, you know, nonstop back to back. And so, like, I came home and I was so hip and cool and I knew all these bands that nobody had ever known about before, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because there was no internet back then. So, sure. you know, local radio was just way different. And so I, I learned about, like, Culture Club and the Arrhythmics and Duran Duran and bands that I'd, you know, never heard of um, on the East Coast. You know, they were that was like what everybody was listening to out there. So and that's definitely moved me in the direction of, that I, you know, wanted to become a DJ and play that kind of music and then producer and, and make that kind of music. And so that that really took shape that summer in San Diego. Wow. So that's a little side note. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um I'm I'm glad that we got to talk because Me too. I mean, I, I often think about like like the people that I met at Atari Computer Camp and what became of them, but I just don't remember all their names. Right. And I'd I'd love to like maybe start some sort of community of people that went to Atari Computer Camps. Yeah, that would be really it on cool. Facebook or something. All right, so I'm gonna I, yeah the, the I I have names and maybe I'm just gonna say them and I mean maybe you can go oh I remember that kid <clears throat> or whatever. Okay. Okay. Ka- Kathy Butts. Oh yeah, I remember her. She was from Miami. Yeah. Yeah. It says here in L.A., but maybe she could have moved. I don't know. <laughs> oh. Um, I, I was surprised. I mean, a girl went to camp. That's like computer camp. No, no, there were several in the in the camp I went to. Huh. Sean Stevens Steventon. Evan Katz. Oh, Evan Katz. That's my friend. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's the guy that that lived two miles down the street from me. Huh. You um, still contact and he with him? is nowhere to be found. Oh, I'm mm-hmm. like tried. I've tried everything on the internet to try to find him. Oh. He's got no Facebook page, no social media presence, no no data about him. It's really oh. weird. I and mean, he he actually became really successful as a ticket reseller because his parents were also like you know, trying to steer him away from, like, getting busted for, you know, stealing phone time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, we didn't pursue the computer thing because it just was sort of taken away from us when your parents could still take things away from you, you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you were next. And then Kelly and Megan Hilgers. Yeah. And... I remember those, too. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I don't remember much about them though. I just remember, yeah, there were, there were a lot of girls there. Huh. Cool. Good for them. I think it was the girls that like actually turned me on to the music, the radio station that was playing all the cool music. Huh. I, de- I definitely think it was them. So it's probably those two. You owe Kelly and Megan a thank you then. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yep, that's, All right, those, are that the, those are the names I have. That's it. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. All right. You bet, man. Later. There's a film about the Atari computer camps. During the first year of the camp, Atari commissioned a half-hour movie called The Magic Room. It was a sort of a documentary, sort of an advertisement for the camps, shot at the University of San Diego site. Atari commissioned filmmakers Robert Halfstrom and his wife Lucy Hilmer to make this infomercial film for promotional and educational purposes. It features Richard Pugh, who was a math teacher from the Cupertino, California School District, as the mentor teacher. He died in 2012. And a couple college-age counselors, computer instructors, and of course, the campers. There are long scenes of kids concentrating, thinking about their programming projects, 
Then their faces light up as they solve their problem. Counselors teach classes. Kids teach each other. Kids teach the counselors. Everyone's learning soccer and horses and an epic pillow fight and shaving cream fight that are clearly staged. There's an adorable scene with a robotic, computer-controlled turtle running around the floor, racing an actual turtle. The music ranges from up-tempo synthesizers to contemplative piano for the sensitive scenes. I want to know what happened to these kids. I'm going to play three minutes of audio from the end of the movie. It starts in the computer lab, a classroom filled with the kids and Atari 800s. Then it moves to a night scene with a glowing outdoor bonfire. Okay, now here's the hey lolly lolly. And the first note here is A, all right? The next note is hey lolly. It's two A's in a row, so you put 73 down twice, okay? Then it goes to an F sharp. Well, what's an F sharp? That's easy, you just look up here. F sharp is 86. So you put that data in. Okay, now you, you ready? Okay, we're going to try something here. Now, could you all listen? On one computer, we have the melody of Hey, Lottie, Lottie. The other computer, we have the rhythm, just the chords. And we're going to try to synchronize them. That means they're both going to have to go hit return at the same time. Ready, set, go. I think the kids are having a lot of fun this summer because they're able to put their ideas into the computer. You see, the thing is, when they came to camp, they wanted to use computers in college. They wanted to be able to use it in the business world extreme practical reasons to be there and yet they're using it now as a tool for their own personal expression the goal to make a kid feel good about himself and feel positive in his attitude towards a computer. You know, a computer can't be a scary thing. And I feel, watching these kids, I feel that I've come close to my goal. I feel good about what I've done. I think I've done my job. I think that when they, if they look back upon this summer, 10, 20, 30 years from now, they're not going to remember all of the, the commands, perhaps. Maybe if this is the last time they even see a computer. But I, I bet you they never forget what they programmed. I love that the credits for the movie were done with an Atari. Check the show notes at ataripodcast.com for the whole movie, or at least watch the three-minute trailer. We're going to hear from one more camper, one of the kids you can see in the Magic Room movie. Barry Champagne attended the San Diego camp in 1982, the session that was filmed for the movie. I was a seventh grader, and it took place between seventh and eighth grade in the mm -hmm. summer. And I think it went from July to August. And it was in, our particular camp was in San Diego. The way I was able to, I, I, my grandmother actually paid for the camp. And I was really into video games at that time. And I saw the ad in the back of one of my video game magazines. And I was able to con slash convince my grandmother, hey, you know, all these video games. And, you know, I owned a 2600, and I was at the local store every day playing video games. Um, I, you know, I tried to convince her, you know, maybe I can be a programmer. Or when in actuality, I was really thinking, like, oh, I'm going to play on computers all day. <laughs> and uh, so she, she footed the bill. And she sent me off to computer camp, and 
Uh, I spent four weeks there. I think you could either do eight weeks or four weeks, and I did four weeks. Mm -hmm. And there were kids from all over the place. Actually, there was a kid, I think his name was like Leendert or something like that. He was from Denmark, Mm -hmm. and there was a kid from Mexico, and he was actually in the little documentary. His name was Enrique. I remember he actually came from Mexico. A couple girls came from Atlanta area, a kid from Utah, and and actually, I don't know that there were too many kids from California. I may have been the only one in that particular dorm that was from California. Um, but it was a it was a really fun experience, and it's something that I wish I would have continued. Um, they taught us like basic programming, I think Pilot, and we were mostly working on the Atari 800s. Mm-hmm. And I know they had Atari 400s in one of the other computer labs. And they kind of ran it like a regular summer camp. So you had other activities as well. And we went off site. Um, but, yeah, it was my, my plan was I was going to go to this camp. I was going to become proficient in computers. And that's all I do the rest of my life. And that's all she wrote. And that's, that's, what, that's the angle I used on my grandmother right. when she bought it. And I, if I remember correctly... I don't think too many of the kids really had a lot of computer experience. Mm-hmm. And I think it was the first year they ran the camp. It was kind of pricey, too. Yeah, it was like and, uh, almost almost $900, I think. Yeah, I, I remember it being quite a bit, and um, that's why I had to go with my grandma. <laughs> you know, pulled in the grandma uh, card on that one. Right. And I think when when kids actually did have computer experience, it was with, like, maybe the old Commodore Vicks or... Uh, what did they call those, like the Trash 80s, the Mm -hmm. TRS-80s? Did you have have any computer experience going in? No, none none whatsoever, and and that's why I was, you know, my parents were sick of me playing video games, and my grandma thought, well, maybe he could do something with it. You know, it was kind of relatively new back then in the early 80s. Yeah. And I, I don't think Atari had home computers very long before they did that. I, I never had one. Hmm. But, of course, I had a 2600. Um, you know, but I was able to, to to learn actually some, you know, little basic programming things. Uh, I, I liked our instructor. I think he was maybe a high school teacher during the mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. And we had a, oh, like a junior instructor. She was cool, too. But, it, you know, all in all, it was a pretty fun experience. And the, um, you know, I'll never forget it. And when I, I heard from you, my wife didn't even know I had done that as a kid. And she said, what? You went to computer camp? <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't stick with it. Uh, a year or two after that, I got pretty big. So then I started playing sports. And I kind of wish I had stuck with computers. I don't play sports anymore, but I could still be doing computers if I yeah. had stuck with yeah. it. So when you were there, they were shooting this this movie. Did I, I want like a sense of how much of, of that movie was was real and how much was staged? Because there, I tell you, there's this pillow fight in there, and this 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 <laughs> scene, the scene with like spraying shaving cream all over. I'm just like this this is not real. Yeah, that was totally staged. That was in the dorm next to me, mm-hmm. and I remember those kids. I, there was a kid, that kid. You know, I didn't even see that movie until you sent me the link. And that's the first time I ever watched it. I was aware of it, and I remember wow. them. They shot it pretty much the whole four weeks we were there. And, um, yeah, the, the pillow fight, they they did that, the shaving cream. But otherwise, you know, it was a, it was a pretty typical camp. Um, I remember them doing interviews with us, and, it, you know, so they only really focused on, like, oh, two or three kids in that video, but – there was a whole other room of kids that they didn't even film. So the camp was pretty big, but they just happened to film our classroom. Mm-hmm. And the so it was a continuity thing. It looks like it was all shot in one day mm-hmm. because every day we would come in, we'd have to change our clothes. Right. So our clothes <laughs> would match from the day before. And uh, one time I got in trouble because I was annoyed at having to do it every day. So I s- kind of circumvented the wardrobe lady and I went in and sat in my little spot, and she somehow caught me and told me, you know, go back out and change your shirt. <laughs> and, you know, like I said, I never even 
knew what that video was for. Um, then a couple years later, when I was in high school, so maybe two or three years, uh, some guy came to our high school and he was giving some, you know, some presentation about computers, and he used a little clip from that. And I saw myself running in the background, and then I saw that kid that I knew, JJ, and I was like, oh, wow, there's that cool. film. And then I forgot about it for 20-something years. So did you show your wife this, the movie last night? Yeah, she watched it with me last night. You sent me the link, and then you know, I was kind of explaining to her about that. and So we sat down and watched it, and um, it was, I guess, an accurate portrayal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but the, obviously that stuff was staged. It was totally staged. And we heard about it the next day. We're like, wait, we didn't get to have a pillow fight. Why did they pick that <laughs> dorm and not our dorm? <laughs> So what, how do I find you in the movie? What are you? Which, which kid are you? Which little? I'm kid? the fat little kid with a bowl haircut, and a, I'm wearing a white shirt. Okay. And I, I even heard him say my name, our instructor, which I told my wife. I said, I think his name is Richard. And then sure enough, we saw the credits. His name was Richard. So he says something like Barry and so and so and so and so. And when we're in the computer lab, I'm sitting in the corner, so you don't see right. me too much. I'll have to watch um, it again and, and look for you. Yeah, well, it's I'm very memor- um, forgettable in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, afterwards, um, my my wife said, "Hey, you should look those people up," because I remembered some names of some kids that I was friends with there, but they weren't in the credits. Like I said, they only did our classroom; they didn't do both classrooms. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a real interesting cross section of kids that were there. Um, you know, all different types, all different kinds came from. Mostly the western United States, but we have a few that came from far away. And, um, you know, we had, a, we had a couple camp bullies in there, and I was stuck in the dorm with them, so I always wanted to be in the dorm next door where they were having pillow fights. <laughs> but they were, I think the age of the camp was maybe like 10 to 18. Yeah, okay, so and some of the, some of the stuff I read said 10 to 18, but then... Some of the docu- some of the I'd say ten to sixteen. So I, I think they might have dialed back the age. It could have been sixteen, actually. I just yeah. remember there was a guy there named Gene, and he must have been from San Diego because he drove his car there, and he hmm. hid it, and he kept it in the dorms. We stayed in the dorms of uh, University of San Diego campus, and so he he would get in his car and he'd go places. Hmm. And I always thought, oh wow. And we went to the beach a couple times. We went horseback riding. We took tennis lessons like every other day. I really liked that. Yeah. But it, it was, uh, you know, we. I, I feel like I got my grandmother's money's worth on a summer camp. Now, as far as learning computing that I continued with, no, I probably, probably wasted her money on that. It's, yeah, like I said, it's something that I really wish I would have stuck with. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I I went sports direction, and that's all she wrote. I will say this. When my friends found out I was going, they flipped. They were so jealous, um, you know, because Atari, that was it back in the day. And to be able to go to camp and, um, you know, plus I got to go out of town to San Diego. We didn't live that close to San Diego. Um yeah. You know, I was envied by everybody. And then I come home with this nice green T-shirt, and I would wear it all the time. I think it's still somewhere put away. Um, you know, people would come up and ask me, like, where'd you get that shirt? How'd you get that shirt? I, I mean, that thing was my pride and joy. I wore it all the time. <laughs> nice. so that, it, you know, that was I, I was probably pretty envied in my hometown for being able to, you know, go to computer camp. Yeah. And I tried the next year to see if I could get my grandma to do it twice, and it was a it was a one and done thing. So, <laughs> luckily, I I got it, you know, the first time. And I know somewhere my mom saved all that stuff because I have a binder of um, all the pictures and screenshots, and they were literally a screenshot. They gave you this Polaroid camera, and it had like a big funnel-looking thing, and you would stick it over the screen. And then you'd take a picture, and uh-huh. a Polaroid would come out. So I have a, a binder full of those somewhere, and it was mostly just cool little graphic things that I made, my name 
you know, like a million times on the screen. Um, but I have that somewhere, and I have a binder and the T-shirt. And uh, but I, you know, I have my memory, and it was it was a good time. My kids, um, you know, they know I'm a closet nerd, so they were like, "Wow, you went to computer camp." And then my kids were asking me, like, which one is you? And I see that dorky-looking kid right there. That's me. <laughs> and now my, my son, who's about the same age I am, I was then, you know, he he's asking me, hey, if you went to computer camp, can can I go away? So I might have opened up something here. <laughs> You've got to continue the trend. You got yeah, to no, trend. definitely. And he's he's way more talented than <laughs> I am or ever was. So he he might be the one to fulfill that champagne destiny so okay uh in the movie the guy says near the end he's like in 30 years these kids might not remember the exact programming command but they'll remember the program they made and what it did so i'm asking i'm going to see if this guy is right or if he's a liar can you tell me like the program you did and what it what it did okay he's exactly right i do not remember the programming or the command and i can remember Oh gosh, no. I mean, I can I can remember programs we did, um, and it is you know thirty some odd years later. I, I remember having a good time. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, it was. A, it, yeah, like I said, it was a good experience. I I feel like I got my grandmother's money's worth in that I was entertained. I had fun. Um, you know, and and I got to meet a lot of cool people, and I still remember them to this day. I, I have pretty good memories. So when I was talking to my wife about it, I was naming off all these people, and I said, "Oh, that's so and so, that's so and so." And then when the credits came up, I was right. <laughs> nice. Thank you so much, Barry. This is great. We've heard about the Atari camp experience from the camper's perspective. Now we're going to talk to one of the adults at the camps. Paul Sommerfeld was a camp teaching assistant. First year, he was teaching assistant in Glencoe, Maryland. Then for his second year, he was in Greenfield, Massachusetts. This interview occurred February 19, 2015. What did a teaching assistant do at Atari Computer Camps? Pretty much what a teaching assistant would do anywhere. Uh, The uh, camps had uh, uh, two teachers. Actually, I think we only had one teacher in 84. Uh, they were cutting back, I guess, because, uh, of course, you can see by the stuff I sent you that we went down from, I think, seven or ten camps down to two camps in 84. Uh, mm-hmm. And so they had only one uh, one teacher there, whereas in 83 we had uh, two teachers. Uh, so the, the teaching assistant would basically uh, help the campers out with uh, – any questions they had and and guide them along to to help them get the uh uh do the programming assignments themselves but but offer them a little bit of guidance so that they would would come to the answer themselves rather than just giving them the answer sure so how did you get the job uh i subscribed to some old magazine that involved technology. It was only around for about a year and I've I've misplaced the magazine so I couldn't tell you what the name of it was. But they had a pretty nice article on the camp and uh so I thought it'd be a pretty interesting thing to apply for. Uh mm-hmm. and so I applied for it and my sister thought, hey, that's a good idea and she applied for it as well. Uh she just went for general counsel, though. She didn't have the computer background I did. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we both got hired. Uh, I went to uh, Maryland, and she went to Faribault, Minnesota. All right. So you're, you're, where did you live at the time? Uh, the same place, Dunkirk, New York. Uh, okay. So and, did, they, uh, did they fly you out there, or were you expected to get yourself to Maryland on your own or for the gig well, or what? Well, I was expected to get myself out there. Uh, As part of the hiring process, uh, they wanted me to drive to one of the teacher's residences. I guess not so much residence, but uh, uh, the uh, place where he normally lived, uh, which I think was Philadelphia at the time, and there was no way that I could – it was the middle of the school semester, and there was no way I could get out there. And so Mm -hmm. I thought I had lost the job by saying, no, I can't go out and get interviewed. 
And, uh, uh, just, uh, just to place it, how old are you about at this time? I was 20 years old. Okay. Two zero. Mm-hmm. And uh, apparently that wasn't the wrong thing to say because uh, they uh, – uh, a couple of days later, he called back and set up and arranged an interview and asked me where we could meet to do the interview. And uh, he interviewed people uh, in uh, Pittsburgh and then came up here, and he hi- or interviewed three people at my college campus, which isn't that big of a college campus, and at least two of us were hired. So I thought that was kind of interesting because I'd, I'd worked with one of the other people that I would uh, got interviewed with. And uh, then after he left here, he went elsewhere and interviewed at other places as well. Okay, so then June 1983 comes around, and you how did you get yourself to uh, to Maryland? Uh, my sister wanted to go on a vacation, so she drove me down there. Uh, okay. And uh, I don't know if you've looked at a map, but Glencoe is not exactly uh, on the beaten path. <laughs> at least it, it wasn't on the beaten path back then. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, uh, uh, just up the road from Sparks, Maryland, which, uh, now I guess is the headquarters to, uh, McCormick Foods. And then just a little bit further down the road from there, I didn't know it at the time because I didn't really look at the ads that closely, uh, is a place called Hunt Valley, uh, which was, uh, uh, make fire ace or something like that uh, there was a game company that was uh, out of there hmm. uh, make fire alley or something like that yeah uh, it rings, it rings a bell um, and had I had I known they were there I would have uh, knocked on their door and uh, and tried to convince the bosses at the camp to get these uh, Atari programmers to come and give a presentation to us <laughs> but uh, but it wasn't until a couple of years later that I put two and two together and realized so Day late and a dollar short there. So tell me about the the facility. Um, when I, when I think summer camp, I think a sprawling area with you know meadows for kids to run around and maybe a pool and I, I don't know you know uh, risers for kids to sit on and sing camp songs and that it, and is this was this a completely different experience or or was it like was it like that? Well, both camps were uh, um, improved facilities. Uh, they were both uh, girls sleep away high schools, uh, very expensive sleep away high schools. Uh, I recently looked up the uh, the cost of tuition there, and it's uh, about uh, three or four or five times what I pay going to school right now. It's about forty thousand dollars a year. So these were boarding schools for girls. These, these were yeah. these were yes. Uh, and they're using the facility in their off season, basically. Yeah, yeah. the the facilities were were very large, uh, uh, but not necessarily modern uh, would be the word I would use. Although they were in the process of modernizing them, uh, they were uh, forced to um, put in a sprinkler system into their school system, and as part of this sprinkler system they uh, had to put in a place to to hold the water so that the the sprinklers would work. And so what they had done was basically created a pool, and then whenever there was a fire, they would siphon the water from the swimming pool to operate the sprinklers with. And so the warning was that if you were in the pool and you heard the fire alarm go off, you had to get out of the pool immediately for fear that you would be sucked into the intakes that would be <laughs> draining the water out to put out some fire somewhere on campus. And, of course, that always made you wonder what they were thinking, but uh, it wasn't exactly Atari's idea. It was uh, the school's idea. Sure. sure. And, of course, Atari's uh, basic philosophy for all of this was uh, – that it wasn't just a computer school or a computer camp. They wanted you to have a well-rounded education. So they had uh, uh, artists and uh, athletics and and uh, and both of the camps that I went to, they also had horseback riding. Uh, and so you would you would spend a couple of uh, sessions during the day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, 
uh, doing uh, your computer-related items. And then in the morning and afternoon, you would also have, the campers would also have a uh, other activity. Uh, my roommate for part of the time was uh, a uh, tennis instructor, so they would actually get uh, tennis instruction. Uh, and he and uh, the uh, uh, young woman who ran the, the art school were from Europe. They were Europeans who had come over uh, to get introduced to America. In fact, I, as recently as four or five years ago, I uh, looked up and they still have Atari computer camps listed as a potential job for uh, people from Europe wanting to come over here. <laughs> so they obviously don't uh, update their things very well. <laughs> so was was a well-rounded summer what the what the campers wanted? Because if I was that age and I got to go to Atari Computer Camp, the last thing I would want to be do is be put on a horse or made to play tennis. <laughs> well, the because not all of the camps did the horse thing. Yeah, uh, there were only two or three of them. I think there were two on the east coast and one on the west coast. Mm-hmm. That was that was a kind of a self motivating thing. If okay. you were if you were at the the ones the the Maryland or the Massachusetts one, then you wanted to be there because the horses were there. Otherwise, you could have gone to Faribault or uh, the Poconos or any of the. Uh, I think Asheville was another one that was on the East Coast. Uh, uh, as far as playing tennis or uh, doing all those other outside activities. Yeah, they were kind of frustrated that they couldn't do the computers all the time. But there were other there was there not all the kids were were focused in on computers. There were some that were that wanted to do the outside stuff and felt that they were being forced to be inside to mess with the computers. Hmm. Uh, it, it was some of it I think was driven by the kids wanting to come to a computer camp, and others was other. In other ways, it was driven by the parents who wanted their kids to be more well-rounded in the other way, where they right. saw the computers coming out and here's here's Atari computer camps. Why don't we send our kid to this camp and see what happens? Uh, you know, and we had a wide range of uh, of uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, I can remember the uh, one parent who drove his. Uh, child into camp with a, a beat up old Volkswagen Beetle. And then there was the uh, camper in Massachusetts who was brought to camp in his uh, father's huge 500 helicopter. <laughs> and we had foreign students and uh, basically they were uh, aged from 8 to uh, 16. Do you know what it cost to go to the camp? If I remember correctly, it was $1,000 for a two-week session. And there were four two-week sessions. And uh, the the camper, of course, could stay for one two-week session or he could stay for the entire summer. We had one camper who did stay for the entire summer. He was yeah. he came in a little bit late, so he's like four or five days late, but he had stayed for the whole summer. And he was, hmm. he was one of our foreign uh, students. He was uh, the son of a Nigerian oil businessman and nephew of the ambassador to the U.S. And we had uh, a few uh, military brats as well. Sounds like you had a collection of characters there. I, it certainly was interesting. It was interesting to meet a lot of different people. A lot of the kids were down to earth, but there were some kids that were brats. <laughs> <laughs> and that summer of 83 was uh, busy that summer. I think we had for the first session about 75 or 80 campers and then for the next two sessions we had about 100 each but then the last session uh, uh, as the summer wound down we only had 20 hmm. and mostly the mix was about uh, two-thirds uh, boys to one-third girls but that last one we had uh, uh, 19 boys and one girl oh. I'm and surprised. It was, I, I don't know why I'm surprised, but I feel surprised that it was that many girls. I, I recently found a. a I got on, on on eBay. I got a binder of from from someone's 
Atari camp experience. And there's a bunch of notes in there, of, like all their friends and stuff, and you know addresses so they could write after camp was out. And there was two girls on there who were actually sisters. And I'm just like, oh, girls went to this camp. That's awesome. Well, I think again that's a self uh, uh, a self selecting thing for our camp as well, because right. girls and horses go together. So. Mm. Age has diminished my memory a little bit, so I don't know whether or not very many people came as brother and sister. You know, if you're sending the kid who wants to go to the uh, computer camp, then you want to send the daughter to the same place. Well, she likes horses, so let's send him to the horse camp kind of a thing. But I I really can't say whether that's for sure or not because it's been so long. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, in addition to their, uh, their... programmed time. They also had free time with the computer. Uh, and we had a lending library of uh, of programs that they could uh, uh, play with. And uh, we, uh, as teaching assistants, would have to proctor that, uh, that lab and also uh, make sure that nobody stole the software. Uh, so there'd mm-hmm. be one of us that ran the uh, lending library and made sure that uh, everything that we gave out, we got back again. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the tortures of uh, of uh, doing the proctoring was that uh, everybody wanted everybody else to hear what game they were playing. <laughs> and I cannot listen to the theme from Donkey Kong anymore. <laughs> it, it it reminds me of camp, which is a bo- which is a good thing, but it was just so so much of a torture hearing that thing with the volume turned way up that it kind of made me want to pull my hair out. So you, you saved all these papers from camp, which is just amazing. And thank you for spending those to us. One of them is like the, the list of classroom, classroom equipment that Atari provided you guys. I mean, it seems to me that they outfitted you. I mean, you guys seemed, it seems like you were set up. We were an official Atari project but it was we were we were not officially a part of Atari. We were, I think they call it uh, special projects was uh, what we were. I think we were a part of Weight Watchers. In other words, Atari and Weight Watchers came together and said this is a good idea for a business opportunity. Hmm. And so we were a combination of both of them. Uh, and so they got together and uh, and came up with this idea and set up all these neat locations uh, for us to do. Uh, wow. And uh, so Atari didn't want to do things second class because they, they saw this as, at least I, I assume they saw this as a, as a long-term business plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, as the wheels started falling off the truck for Atari corporate itself back in 84, uh, I you know you really don't know what they were thinking at that point. So as far as you know, did the camp basically just happen the the two summers, eighty three and eighty four? Uh, it actually started in eighty two, and the only one that I am aware of, uh, I know there were several other locations, uh, but I'm certain only of uh, UCSD, University of San Diego, University of California at San Diego. And I think there was one in uh, the San Francisco area, but I can't remember the name of it. But they had an article on it in Antic or uh, Analog. I think Antic. Uh, and and our, our teachers from 83 were from that camp in 82. At the end of the summer in 84, when they were knew that they weren't going to have any more camps, they started selling these things at, at – uh, fire sale rates, and mm-hmm. I did buy a couple of the things that they had listed here. Nice. <laughs> they also had, um, as part of the lending library, a, uh, a book library where they had all sorts of these different books that you could read. And there were some that were, were you know, not very big. They, they weren't very challenging. Mm-hmm. But there was a they had a book on uh, artificial intelligence, which is pretty much still considered one of the classic books, because I see it's still being sold in an updated form now on on uh, Amazon for over a hundred dollars. And then that uh, Goodell Escher Bach book, uh, 
And I'm thinking, boy, I read that book twice, and both times it took me six months to read it. I can't imagine uh, the 12 year old kid reading that thing while he's got other things to do at camp in the space of two weeks. <laughs> and those are prized possessions because they have on the inside property of Atari special projects on it. That's awesome that you saved the save the stuff. Well, it's it's part pack right and part historian. So on a day to day basis, I mean, I, I'd be asked if it was a like, was it a fun job? Was it a good job? But you went back a second year, so I think I know your answer. <laughs> that first session kind of took all of us counselors by surprise, and the campers just just took advantage of us in ways that were incredible. <laughs> they would have water balloon fights that were unsanctioned. They would... Um, use the lavatories and write things on the walls that were inappropriate, using inappropriate materials. Uh, I'll let you leave that to your imagination. Uh, and they did did several other things, and they, they sassed back to us. And and so one morning we got them on bed like an hour or two hours earlier than they were supposed to be uh, gotten up and read them the riot act, and it was smooth sailing for, uh, for the rest of the summer. And... And the the summer was a blast, and of course it's it's as counselors we had to make sure that they were uh, bedding down and preparing to bed down properly for the night, and they of course would always try to extend their their stay up times. And uh, apparently I had said one too many times I don't want to hear about it. Well, perhaps I said that every night multiple times, and uh, as part of the uh, camper activities that they had one night uh every uh term was a uh they would have to put on some sort of a skit or a play or talent show or something like that mm-hmm. and i can remember this one kid uh being me and so they acted like it was bedtime and a bunch of the campers would walk up to the guy who was being me and saying various things and then the guy who was being me said, I don't want to hear about it. And I thought, well, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery or something like that. (laughs) I hadn't thought about that for years until uh, just this past week. Around that time, uh, there was, uh, they would, they would have movies most every night. uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the movies that they played was, uh, Megaforce or something like that. It was some PG movie that uh, would appeal to the to the young adult, young kid. Mm-hmm. And uh, in it, one of the bad guys says, "I don't want to hear about it." And <laughs> uh, and it was like every kid's head was on a swivel in that room because as soon as that actor had said that on screen, everybody looked at me and started saying, "Hey, Paul." The '84 camp we had a. Uh, one camper who uh, intimidated me quite a bit. He uh, was kind of advanced in his programming, and he was being taught how to do linked lists in Atari Basic. And I thought I couldn't wrap my head around that, and, but he apparently did it fairly successfully too. And then another camper uh, said that he was published in Antic Magazine, and sure enough, you look at his. Antic magazine, and there was his name on the cover, cool. or maybe not on the cover, but certainly in the uh, masthead. So that second summer was it more the same, or were things significantly different as the wheels were falling off the boat? Uh, like you said, or? the amount of campers was definitely reduced. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were, you know, I think, at our peak we had about fifty, but I I can't really remember how many we had all told. You know, the day after we get there, or maybe two days after we get there, we find out that uh, we're basically being orphaned. Uh, so, <laughs> where before we could uh, we could call uh, Sunnyvale for support, uh, instead now we basically got to take care of things on our own. And I think you see in that one document it tells you where to where we were supposed to call for our tech support. Mm-hmm. Uh, some local stores or what have you. And and anybody but Sunnyvale. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it was it was one of the divisions or one of the parts of the uh, the Atari that wasn't sold off. 
it was so it, it never we were never under the Tremel umbrella or Tremel however you pronounce its name. Yeah. Uh we were uh we were under the the other side of the umbrella of the part that kept uh stayed with Warner Communications. Then of course that time I did take a little side trip. Uh, I had a car this time around and I uh, drove myself to uh to Cherry Valley and uh visited the uh offices of analog and I tried to convince them that it'd be fun for them to come and visit us and uh put on a little uh routine on, on Atari's but uh they didn't really give me their number to say I could contact my boss and have them come and do it. Didn't seem too interested, huh? No, not really. Uh, the first year we had um Jim Dunyon come in and, and do a song and dance routine for us. He uh told us all about uh Atari research and uh and he even did a song and dance, uh, in the song I Love Rock and Roll by Joan Jett. He replaced mm-hmm. the words with things to do with Atari research, and that was rather entertaining, but I'm not going to try and sing it for you because I don't have the voice for it. Yeah, and it was things like that that we, we basically lost when we uh, when we lost the regular Atari. I can still remember the uh, camp director's car rolling backwards down a hill, <laughs> I can remember several of the uh, changes where the the one you know the Saturday the campers would leave and then the Sunday the new group of campers would come in and the change in philosophies where there was uh, uh, the director at eighty three basically uh, saved all of the money he was supposed to be spending it all along on on all of the uh, groups uh, equally. But in the end, he didn't. He he saved it, and then the last session got a nice trip to Hershey uh, Hershey Park in Pennsylvania. Cool. Huh. And so that was kind of fun for us and for the people who were there all summer long. But uh, because we had so few campers, they had let some counselors go. So the counselors that were let go didn't get to participate in that trip. And then in '84, because the uh, the director was. Uh, doing these uh things all along it meant that these uh events had to be less spectacular and so we went uh, to I'm trying to remember the name of the the little park it was basically part of a stream that had um glaciers had basically put sinkholes into the into the ground along this river bank and it was an area that uh, everybody would go and and have fun at i had my car then and so i drove a group of the campers out there and uh and unfortunately we had a little accident where uh well like i said people used to go and hang out there and mm-hmm. at night it would be people that drank beer and so at the bottom mm-hmm. of some of these sinkholes there would be broken bottles of uh, beer in there mm-hmm. and uh one of the campers had stepped on uh uh, some broken glass and put a nice gouge in his foot, and mm-hmm. so I got to play ambulance. And so while everybody else was enjoying their uh, wonderful uh, day at the park, the camper was stuck in the uh, emergency room, and I was stuck yeah. in the waiting room watching the, uh, I can't remember, it was a Democrat or the Republican National Convention. Mm-hmm. Not exactly an exciting saying. time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any 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 fun or drama or hookups or anything with the, with the adults, the counselors, the teachers? Yeah, but I usually never uh, got into that kind of salacious thing. If you could send a message to the Atari computer users that still exist, and some of which undoubtedly went to the Atari camps, what would you tell them? Basically, Atari camp was my only foray so far into the uh, computer industry. Uh, after that, I... I sold auto parts for a while. And I kind of think of the Ataris as uh, classic old cars, where a classic car is uh, is pretty much only original once. And so you should keep it running as original as you can, because the original cars are worth more than the cars that are modified, hmm. unless you can do a spectacular job at it. I haven't seen that happen yet. Right. So I would say keep your... Keep your computers original <laughs> and and continue to use them and continue to drive them. All right, Paul, thank you so very much. You're welcome.
Paul has a nice collection of documents from his time at the camps, which he scanned, including the staff manual. We started with the campers, then an instructor. Now we move to the top. Bob Kahn was director of special projects at Atari from 1982 to 1984. He was responsible for the entire computer portion of the summer camp program, curriculum, staffing, equipment and materials, library, everything, for both Atari computer camps and the Atari Club Med project, which was in the summer of 1983, which we talk about a bit in this interview too. This interview took place April 20th, 2015. I would like you to start with telling me how you got hired by Atari. <laughs> how I got hired by Atari. Well, um, this, this requires a little bit of history. It's sure. not, not a long-winded history. In the late 19th, I went to Berkeley. Uh, you've probably heard of it. Mm -hmm. uh, in <laughs> the cool. 60s. you probably heard of Berkeley in the 60s, actually. <laughs> uh, in the late 60s. And I was there for all that stuff. Uh, but I had an unusual job in graduate school. I was there for an undergrad with, with a major in psychology and a minor in math. And after a year off, I went back to graduate school in the School of Education to get a PhD in educational psychology with an emphasis on using computers uh, in educational ways, either to teach people about computers or to use the computers to teach people about something else. And I've spent a whole lifetime career in that area. And while I was in graduate school at Berkeley, there is a science museum above the campus. It's called the Lawrence Hall of Science, named mm -hmm. after Ernest Lawrence, the physicist. And I was the director, I became the director in 1971 of a program called the Computer Education Project, which is a time-sharing computer uh, being used by the hall itself uh, in public ways and also as a, a feed to a few schools in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, since it was time-sharing have links out to schools, uh, and they decided that there was a, a lot of interest uh, growing from young kids in learning about computers, what they could do and what you could do with them. And so I started a program that became the biggest program of the Lawrence Hall, the most important money-making program there, uh, and also the most attended, uh, to teach kids around the Bay Area about what you could do with a computer and what was a computer all that kind of stuff, uh, which was to be the subject of my dissertation, but uh, I never quite got finished. <laughs> so uh, I have that background. Uh, I went to work for an industrial design firm in San Francisco that was putting computerized exhibits in museums, science museums. Mm -hmm. And my brother, my younger brother, also went to Berkeley, but he had connections to Xerox, Palo Alto, and Alan Kay, and the whole Dynabook, uh, well, the Alto project. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got a job at Atari, and he introduced the head of marketing for, educational marketing for Atari to me. And so your brother, your brother must be Ted Kahn, then? My brother's Ted. He ended up uh, running the Atari Institute for Education. He lives around here, too. The person who, who we both know is named Peter Rosenthal. And Peter came and visited me at, at the design studio where I was working uh, and said, I'd like to come join us at Atari in educational marketing. And so I started trekking from Berkeley to Sunnyvale, which is you know, halfway down the peninsula here in San Francisco every day. And uh, in my early months at uh, Atari, I was in the education marketing department, of which there were only three or four of us, part of the marketing department, and I'm the person who was responsible for bringing to life Atari Pilot. Pilot was a, wasn't really a programming language per se, it was developed by a guy named John Starkweather, who was a professor at UCSF, San Francisco Med Center, for teaching people how to do stuff. It was an interactive dialogue kind of program, basically. Um, but we decided that you could use it in education and it was, you could do interesting things with it, particularly with an Atari 800 because, or 400, uh, because uh, you could generate graphics with it uh, and you could generate interactive dialogues easily. Uh, so you could use it with younger children. That was the, the idea. And somewhere around 1982, Atari hired a 
a woman from New York, Linda Gordon was her name, and she's now remarried, and I can't remember her last name now, as vice president of something they call Special Projects. And that was about the same time that Alan Kay and his crew came on board Atari uh, to start the Atari Research Center, the Advanced Research Center. Um, and this was all an outgrowth of Atari moving from video games into computers. Uh, so this is the age of Atari Rider, this is the age of Atari Basic, Atari, you know, all the stuff that was... Uh, for programming and, 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 you know, computer, the computer itself versus just a game machine. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure who actually got the idea, uh, because there were no such things at that time, but when Linda Gordon came to Atari uh, for a special project, she came and found me and she said, we're starting a new group here, a special projects group. Uh, we're going to do it in conjunction with Atari Research. And we want to set up summer camps all over the country or in several locations around the country and have kids go to summer camp. And in addition to the normal summer camp things that you would do, uh, we'll have computers there, Atari computers. Uh, and we want to do it in the way that only Atari can do it, which includes everything from the special Atari logo t-shirts to uh, all things Atari that might be appropriate in a summer camp environment. Uh, so I want you to, you know, move out of educational market and come work for me and hire a group of uh, people that you think would be appropriate to come up with the stuff that we would teach kids in those summer camps uh, and the activities we would do with them. And I went, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so we, that's what we did. And um, I hired uh, a friend of mine from Berkeley who's a PhD in, in um, science education and also a computer scientist by training. We hired two teachers uh, who worked with us part-time during the school year and all summer during the summer. Uh, both teachers had use computers. At this time, there was a group called Computer Using Educators in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in the same way that I had worked with Lawrence Hall and was using time sharing, there, there were people using various forms of computing in educational settings in the early 1980s in the Bay Area. It wasn't necessarily that widespread around the country, mm -hmm. but the Bay Area is kind of a, as you probably know, a innovation spot for things like that. Mm -hmm. And I myself learned how to program, you won't believe this, but in 1962 on a controlled data desktop computer that was wheeled into our high school in Denver, Colorado. Oh. Um, and I learned how to program in Fortran 2. Um, and that was unheard of. So I was just taking that and moving it forward. And so now here was the ultimate challenge. Uh, how about if we did that in, in an informal setting at the summer camp? Informal learning is different than formal learning, formal classroom learning. And the museum experience I had at Lawrence Hall Science was quite informal. Mm -hmm. Even though we had classes there, it wasn't the kind of thing where you were graded. It wasn't the kind of thing where you had assignments. Uh, it was more follow your interest. So the challenge uh, for a summer camp was, well, we know these kids are going to come because they're interested, because their parents maybe bought them a computer already, or they want to, or they're thinking about it, uh, or some parents will see this uh, advertised and say, hey, that might be interesting for my kid. And uh, we want to provide them the richest possible experience in the course of two to three weeks, I can't remember how long the sessions were, uh, that we can, and we want to load up these camps with, I've forgotten how many computers, we had, I think, two campers per computer, something like that, so everybody would sit and pair. Mm -hmm. And they would, but that's good for peer learning, by the way, you show your buddy how to do something. Yeah. Uh, we wanted to encourage girls, uh, young women, uh, that was a big uh, push at the Lawrence Hall, we had courses at the Lawrence Hall, we had one called Math for Girls, um, because we were well aware that around age 12, 13, girls usually thought that technology and all that stuff wasn't for them, or it wasn't appropriate, or whatever, and they uh, didn't sign up in the numbers that the guys did. Uh, so we wanted to be sure that summer camp was, was uh, open to everybody and encouraged for everybody. We also wanted to be sure that we talked about things that were relevant 
uh, in the course of camp, and that would be everything from uh, computers in society, to computers in current movies, to uh, encryption, to all those things that are nowadays we're way beyond that, of course, but in those days this was all brand new. Uh, we wanted to be sure that we could use our computers in whatever artistic ways were, were appropriate and possible. That meant, you know, teaching people how to use a computer to draw things on a screen, and draw things on a XY plotter. Uh, and later, in the second year of this, we had two sessions of this, uh, 82 and 83 summers. Uh, we actually got Topo robots from, uh, uh, I've forgotten where Nolan Bushnell manufactured those things. Mm -hmm. And we were able to program and, and uh, uh, move them around. We also had, I can't remember if we had Papper Turtles, from Seymour Papper was at MIT. Uh, he developed a language called Logo. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to be sure that kids could uh, learn to do programming that wasn't just on screen. Uh, we so the, to make those sure. are the those are the physical turtles that actually moved around on the floor or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yep. 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 Neat. Yeah, run them through a maze, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we we wanted to be sure to use the music processor, certainly the graphics card. The Atari, Atari's advantage over an Apple II was it had specific processors to do graphics and sound, which sure. uh, obviously made it much more interesting. Uh, we wanted to introduce them to other things. Uh, Particularly when we got to the Club Med project, uh, it had to be even more informal than this, and so we, we wanted to take advantage of anything. And by the time 1982-83 came, there was a lot of software for an Atari 800. And of course, there was Apex. Yeah, I see Pac-Man on the wall and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was both a uh, chance to teach programming and also a chance to teach, uh, I don't know what you'd call it exactly, computer literacy or computer fun or computer, play with a computer or what you name it, computer, computer related stuff. Have, you have a captive audience, a very interested audience. Uh, the problem at summer camp was, and we teamed up, uh, the, the idea with this was that Atari had no idea how to run a summer camp and that's not surprising. To be honest, Atari had no idea how to run a computer company, <laughs> actually the video game company, which is what did that man. So we teamed up with some uh, summer camp guys in, in New York City who'd been running summer camps all over the country for many years. And we let them be in charge of the normal camp activities and the whole setup. We made sure that these uh, camps were situated on college campuses, often very pretty ones. Uh, there were like six or seven locations all around the country. There was one in Massachusetts, one in Baltimore, one in Pennsylvania, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. If you saw me on the Today Show, that was Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, there was one in San Diego here in California. And in the second year, there was a second one here that Alan Kay's group was working with in the uh, East, uh, East Bay in Danville, California. Um, there was one in somewhere in the Midwest, too. I think it was Chesapeake Bay, something like that. No, that, that was Baltimore. There was one in uh, Minnesota. So, uh, and I didn't visit all of these. I, I was at the one in Asheville and the one in San Diego. But um, the idea is we would hire college students to be the instructors, college students who had some track record working with kids, because that was very important. And typically there would be one mentor teacher, uh, a public school teacher who would work with, along with the, the college kids, and that was the team and the staff. And we spent quite a long time with some very busy people developing full-scale curriculum for these people. And a full-scale curriculum in Atari uh, computer camps was something like this binder mm -hmm. that had something like these floppy disks that had something like all of these sections, including what you're supposed to, you know, it was, it, if you hadn't taught me, yeah. uh, you, this one is about, this is advanced, this is about strings and uh, arrays and databases and stuff like that. Um, but we had stuff at this very same kind of thing including exercises the discs have all the stuff that you need to run these things uh, to go through this curriculum uh, and so that a young um, college instructor could learn this material and, and teach from it uh, and so the kids had choices uh, when they came it depended kind of on what you already knew and what you were interested in as to what you might take if you didn't know anything, we had uh, we started with uh, learning some programming, you know, rudimentary programming in Pilot, 
uh, and we had advanced pilot. We got quite ways with that. We switched to Logo in the second year when Logo became available. Mm -hmm. uh, Logo is a baby lisp. Uh, I don't know what you know about computers and programming. Uh, we, of course, had BASIC, and in the second year, we had Microsoft BASIC. We also had other languages, Forth. Um, Forth was used, you could attach an Atari computer to a telescope or to a device and control it. Yeah. Um, some kids were into that. Uh, we had Pascal. We had, as I told you, we actually have, uh, I forget the company that made it, but Datasoft, I think it was, had a list for the Atari. I'm not sure how many kids actually got into that, but we had copies of it. Uh, we had, um, I think that was most of it. Uh, well, of course, assembly language, Atari Assembler. And so for kids who really wanted to get into the bowels of the machine and understand how to pick and poke and do that, we, we had instructors who were equipped to teach that. So part of the uh, requirement for, for being an instructor in Atari Computer Camps, at least for some of the instructors, was that you had a reasonably sophisticated knowledge of programming. And by that time, uh, there were students around who could do that. Uh, so then my job was to make sure that this all happened. Uh, and in addition to having these people work with me to come up with this curriculum, I also had to stock each camp with a complete library of books and materials. I, don't, I can't find it. I went looking for it, but I don't know where it is. I had kind of an inventory sheet of all the stuff that we sent <laughs> to each of these sites, and it's quite extensive. Um, so there were big ticket items like a Topo robot <laughs> and, there were, uh, and a, and a, and a you know, turtle or a robot turtle. And I can't remember if we had XY plotters. We definitely had uh, koala uh, sketch pads, and uh, we had um, other interface devices, joysticks, of course, but uh, much more sophisticated than that. And uh, we had a, a whole library of books, that main purpose of which is if you're interested in something, you can go over there and just dig in and learn it on your own if you want. Yeah. And I, have, I, I, have a, I have a, for just apropos of that, I have a, uh, a, a cr classroom equipment quantities list from 1984, and I'm not sure what, I have a scan of it. Uh, I'm not sure which camp it's from, but it's like 12 Atari 800 computers, 18 810 disk drives, and four printers, and just a whole shopping yeah, list. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Um, yeah <laughs> there, was, there were several parts of it. There was the hardware part, then there was the books and ancillary part, then there was the software part. We had a huge software library. Uh, we had access to Atari's program exchange, Fred Thurland's Apex. I saw you, the you interviewed Fred. <laughs> and we had... Uh, access to, um, you know, we had everything from the internals manual to uh, the hardware manuals to you name it. Uh, we also had access, if we needed it, to Atari engineers, the likes of Chris Crawford. Uh, I happen to know Steve Mayer, who invented the chips for the Atari 800 set. He lives in San Francisco. He's a good friend of my brother. Uh, so we, we had run of the place in terms of getting the stuff we needed. If we had to have something specifically made that wasn't outrageous, uh, we actually could do that. Uh, so uh, that's what we did. Uh, the first year, uh, I can't remember much about it. It's 32 years ago or something like that, so it's hard to remember details. But I get that a lot when I do these interviews. It's okay. Well, and you know, <laughs> stuff, time flies and you do other things. Yeah. So, um, let's just say we learned a lot from the first year. From It was a success for sure. Uh, we also got uh, some ideas about how to promote the second year, and some of the ideas for promotion were things like the movie that you saw, either the trailer or the full part of the... The, the Magic Room. Magic Room, right. Uh, and that was shot in San Diego, by the way, uh, at the uh, University of San Diego. Uh, I can't remember how they got the girl on the horse in that thing, because I don't remember if they had horseback riding there, but anyway, <laughs> they managed to, to make it a full summer camp experience. Uh, and uh, the, the teacher in there is Richard Pugh. He was from San Jose. He's still around, I believe. Both he and his wife were teachers. Uh, the main teacher, he had a couple of helpers as well. And uh, so for the second year, we um, we decided to, A, make that movie. And Linda decided that, that we should have this promotional movie. Uh, Where was that so show? Well, I'm not sure anymore. I think when they, when Atari went around and did their dog and pony shows at various places, they took that with them and showed it. They must have done it. I think she decided that during the first year, um, 
that they would make that movie. So to use it as a uh, an impetus for people to sign up for the second year, I really I believe the date on it is eighty two, and that would make sense. So it was probably shot at in the San Diego camp in the first year, uh, and then and there's probably things that aren't in there that were in the second year because the technology advanced by the second year. Like there's, I don't think there's any Topo robots in that uh, in that video. Um, but we did that. Uh, we also got a lot of photographs of real kids at real Atari camps from the first year that we could use in the materials for the second year, which makes perfect sense. Uh, I think we added some locations in the second year, and we tweaked the curriculum considerably based on what happened in the first year, which makes perfect sense also. So we uh, really, you know, got our machine rolling for a, for a, you know all-scale, full-scale uh, second-year Atari computer camp. Right in the middle of all that, Linda Gordon met the head of Club Med, Pierre Shemla, uh, at least the head of Club Med in the Americas, and they decided that what the world really needed was to have something akin to Atari computer camps in the Club Med that's at the end of the Dominican Republic island. You, you drive through very poor neighborhoods in squalor for many miles out to the very end of this very uh, whatever you want to call it uh, third world island and all of a sudden you arrive at a golf course with manicured lawns its own power generation at least it employed local people mm -hmm. not not as the people who manage the club but it, uh, it, you know like gardeners and all kinds of things, things like that and in that place we <laughs> We, we teamed up with Atari Research to put in a whole bunch of computer kiosks. They look like the Atari game kiosk, but they had an Atari 800 in them instead. Uh, and they were networked together, which was unheard of. Wow. Uh, and we even had one at the sailing shack out by the ocean. I'll never forget the day we had one of those tropical squalls that came in out of the blue and dumped a bazillion drops of rain right on that computer. Uh, in its housing, and they took it out of there, turned it upside down, dumped the water <laughs> out of it, started it up again, and it still worked. Wow. It's just something else. Um, so we had those, we had computer stations that were kind of like, you know, while you're wandering around the Club Med campus, you could uh, go up and play Pac-Man or whatever, you know, there was menu, and stuff would run like that. Then there was a classroom and a thatched hut. That was the only building in the whole place that was air-conditioned. <laughs> so a lot of people wanted to go there. Uh, and in there, we, we had families come in, just wander in, and we had little workshop uh, packets for people. And you could take, you know, do whatever you wanted. You want to learn about word processing? Use this packet. You want to learn about what's a spreadsheet? Use this packet. You want to make a tune? Use this packet. So we had so these. How long was this thing open? The Club Man? Yeah. Well, um,. I forget, for several weeks during the summer of 1983. Mm -hmm. um, after 1983, this all came to an abrupt end. Atari had a little problem with money. Uh, and um, I was flying home, I'll never forget, I was flying home from a, a, an educator's con conference in Boston with my wife, and we got waylaid in Cincinnati or somewhere like that. And I called in to say I was going to be late. And I said, don't hurry home. Your desk, Atari's been sold to the Tramiel family, and your desk's being cleaned out as we speak. So, <laughs> um, that was the end of it. That was 84. That was the next summer. Uh, Let me guess. This was the weekend of July 4th, 84. Yeah, something like that. Around <laughs> that. Uh, and so that was that. So there was no Atari computer camp in the, in the summer of 84. Wow. Although we were fully equipped to do it. Uh, but that's, that's how this came to be. I don't know how many people really know about this. I don't know how many people who went to Atari computer camps would uh, respond to some kind of, I don't know what, Facebook inquiry or something like that, you know, if you were to put out a call for If you went to an Atari computer camp, we want to hear from you. Yeah, I've been, I'm <laughs> you would trying. have been about the right age. You would have been perhaps a, a year too young. I can't remember where we started. It was somewhere around 9, 10, 11. Uh, and up to something like 15, I think. That would have been the perfect age. It would have been great. Like mom Sorry, said, no. You didn't get to go. Well, you, you had a great time. Um, I think the cap. I think the length, the duration was a couple of weeks, but I'm not sure. That's I, all those details. I I have been told that they were two week sessions. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so uh, I don't know. What else do you want to know? Um, okay, so 
I was going to ask if the camps were profitable, but that might not be the right question. Was the goal profit or was it to encourage people to be interested in computers for years and years to come? No, you, gotta, you think of it from the, yeah, it's the latter. Think of the kid who said, my parents don't know anything about Atari computers. The one on, on, uh, on the Today Show interview, uh, they just uh, know how to sell them. I think his parents were in the computer or in the electronics business or something. They had a store. Uh, and, yeah, no, the idea was not to make a huge profit. I mean, it had to cover its operating expenses, but this was not, this was not going to be an Atari profit center per se. I think this was going to generate a ton of word-of-mouth interest, uh, social networking kind of interest mm -hmm. in the old way, not the new way. There was no, you know, none of that stuff yet. Uh, where people would tell other people and people would go out and, you know, go to these camps and then they, they'd have to come home and their mom and dad, I've got to have a computer. I Look what I've learned, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then, then their friends learn and that sort of thing. So, I, you have to ask, if you got hold of Linda, whatever her name is now, Linda Gordon, whatever, I can't remember. I can find out for you if you want. Please. Uh, she, being the vice president of this program, could probably give you a much more... Um, counseled opinion about why Atari decided to do this. Um, but uh, it, it, at that time, there was no other... I think there may have been some... I don't think there was anything quite like that in 1983, 1982. There certainly were no Apple computer camps. Uh, and there weren't enough personal computers out there for other people. There was no Commodore computer camps. Uh, so no other company was doing it, that's for sure. And Atari had such a brand name, such a well-known brand name, that it made really good sense for them to do it. Um, but yeah, I don't think it was considered a profit center. I don't think it was a loss either, though I don't really know that. You'd have to, I have no idea. Um, we did spend a lot of money on, on <laughs> stuff that we put out there. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we also had a network. We, uh, we were in touch with a guy at the University of Michigan who was way ahead of his time, and he was on something like the ARPANET, only it was through modems. <laughs> And we actually set up a, a, a email, it would be the equivalent of an email communication ring through the camps so that one camp could email the other ones and say, hey, we're, we're having a problem with this kind of a thing. Have you guys seen this? And is there, have you figured out what to do about it? And then and I have a, actually have a whole folder of these back and forth email communications from these wow. guys. Everything from, can I buy this equipment when the summer's over? To, <laughs> to stuff like, you know, uh, yeah, we... we, we Stop using those discs, all the ones that had zero sectors on them. We've got these new ones, but they're not working either. Does anybody know what's wrong? You know, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, you could pick up a phone as well, but this is much more uh, in tune with the whole program is right. to have some kind of communications uh, direct facility right. in your camp. Practicing what you're preaching, right? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, can you remember any any interesting problems that once you'd set up the camp and then oh my god this is terrible we need to something's terribly wrong or you know tell me a, tell me a story about something unexpected that happened <laughs> i honestly don't remember much from the camps themselves i don't remember I, i'm sure there were um uh the, the horror stories i remember if you want to call them that are from the, from the club med experience <laughs> tell me um, you said you said mentioned last night uh that it would have been easier to set up computers on the moon oh. than in Club Med. So well, that's right. <laughs> Look, think about going through customs in the Dominican Republic, and we're carrying all this high-tech gear with us, and the guys at the Dominican Republic customs are going, what's that? And you're trying to explain, that's, that's, a, uh, uh, that's a printer. We didn't have laptops, obviously. <laughs> uh, that's a small uh, digital or something printer, or that's, a, I don't know, it's an interface cable or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay. Uh, so just, just getting this stuff there was one thing. Uh, the environment of that club med was, was another uh, whole thing. The weather, the heat, the whole business, and the, you know, computers are just, the cards are pretty uh, sturdy in that regard. But, they, you know, if the power goes out, the power goes out. Right. Uh, the so tropical yeah, environment with yeah, the wet and the, yeah, and the squall and the storms and all that stuff. The biggest problem down there was that we were having to put this together. And it was kind of like, uh, never done this before, but it's showtime in three weeks or two weeks or whatever. And we'd gather again, a class of, uh, I mean, a group of college students to be instructors there. And I was there with them. 
And the Atari Research Group was there pulling out their hairs one by one. In fact, we had shirts made up that said, no problem. Um, it was kind of like, that was the answer to anything that you might, you might be having trouble with. No problem, we'll get it done, no problem. Uh, I wish I still had my no problem shirt. Seems like a very <laughs> island attitude. No it was, problem. It yeah. was the it was the attitude. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> but I was actually, to be honest with you, I was actually fired and rehired while I was there uh, uh, because I was having a hard time getting my uh, gang of instructors uh, all in line with it, what they needed to do, and the pressure coming from both the head of the club med and from my boss to. To be up and running was immense, uh, and we just came to blows in a sense. And so one afternoon, I, they'd have enough of my mouthing off, and they let me go. And the next morning, we're walking on the beach, and I'm walking one way, and she and the guy from Club Med are walking the other. And we, we didn't kiss and make up, but we kind of said, "All right, all right, you'll be hired." Okay. Um, so <laughs> it did go off, uh, and it, I think it was a success, but. Uh, you can just imagine, you know, trying to do all that kind of troubleshooting. I can remember the Atari Research guys particularly trying to do technical troubleshooting in that kind of place. You know, if you run out of something you don't have, you can't just go down to the lab around the corner and get something. Yeah. You had to bring everything you might need with you. And we're talking about fairly complex things that weren't common then. Uh, not the least, we were just setting up a network on, you know, the tropical, tropical island um, and trying to get technology to work. But, uh, it was just, uh, it was quite a challenge. And I think the same thing was true in the camps. And honestly, I wish I could give you anecdotes. But it's just too long ago, and I don't remember. And I, the people who could give you the best anecdotes would be the people who were there with the kids. Uh, if you could get hold of Richard Pugh, uh, for example, uh, assuming that he's still alive and uh, willing to talk to you, uh, he, he was in that situation for a whole summer, and he would have all kinds of stories. Uh, I was only a visitor in these places. I was at, in the meta level of creating this from Atari headquarters. So me and my curriculum developers had our own issues, but those are nothing compared to being, sure. quote, down yeah. in the trenches with the, the kids who were at camp and, you know, trying to make things happen. Well, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get interviews at all levels. You on top. I'm getting some counselors in the middle. I'm trying to get kids at the bottom. So we're going to get it covered. Well, yeah, but, so they would be able to give you the anecdotes and the stories and the good times and the crazy times. Uh, I just, I remember things like, you know, the excitement on kids' faces when I'm in the room and there, you know, something happens and I've been debugging this for two hours or three days or whatever it is and I finally figured out that I left out or whatever it was, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, but that's very typical for, for programmers. Uh, so I really don't know. It, it's... It would be fun and for me, just personally, to be able to talk to or hear suppose you end up with some of these kids on your podcast, who were kids on your podcast, who are now 40s or whatever they are, yeah. 40 years old or 50. Uh, you know, what was it like back then? Do you remember your experience? Um, the best thing would be if you could find that kid who was on the video for the Today Show, or some of the kids who were in the in the movie, the Magic Room, mm. assuming they'd be willing to talk. That'd be, I'd be curious to know, you know, was that a blip in your life, or did that change your life, or... Did that you know? How, how, where did that fit into your 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 worldview about technology and what you're doing now? Uh, I mean, that kind of stuff certainly changed my worldview and what I'm doing now. But that's from a slightly different level. But I would love to know, even at the Lawrence Hall where I was for many years, I, I would love to run into some of the kids who were in our earliest class of eight year olds, learning about what a computer is. I have some of the pictures they drew back then. Very interesting pictures. Uh, and I would love to know, you know, did you ever follow that up? Did you do something else related to computers later in your life? I mean, nowadays you can't, can't get away from it. But, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, did that change you in any way? That, that, that sort of thing would be most interesting. But personally, it was much more, you know, managerial thing. I can tell you some things that we tried that were most unusual. Uh, Alan Kay, who you probably heard of if you don't have uh, Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah had an interesting relationship with a guy named Tim Galway. Tim Galway wrote a book called The Inner Game of Tennis. And it was Tim's philosophy that you could teach anybody to play tennis. Uh, and he had some principles about it. It's kind of the zen of tennis, if you want to think of it that way. And so they decided to put this 
to a test in the Danville camp in the second year in 83 when they had that special camp in Danville. So not only were these kids learning how to play tennis uh, using Tim Galway's tennis method, and I never forget having a planning meeting about this where we met at uh, Linda Gordon's house and she had a tennis court in the backyard so we could all go out with Tim and check out his, his ideas. But they tried to apply those some of those ideas to teaching programming. And I have somewhere around here, I don't know if I can find them, but I have somewhere around here the, the cards that came, a stack of cards or whatever it was they came up with to uh, translate the inner game of tennis to the inner game of computer programming. <laughs> um, so, that, I mean, that kind of stuff was, uh, you know, kind of out, out in the, in the uh, whatever you want to call it. That, that's Alan Kay all over again. That's how Alan thinks and what Alan is like. Uh, we, some of the planning sessions we had for this thing were, were quite interesting in their own right just for that reason. We'd all be sitting in a big room, we'd have whiteboards up, or what do you call them, easel boards. Uh, and a lot of visual thinking going on about how best to accomplish some of these goals. Uh, so we had an interesting management team and, and development team, I should say. Uh, and from that point of view, I mean, we had all kinds of discussions. But again, that's all 30-something years ago, and none of us could remember details <laughs> about that. So now I, I wish I could give you more anecdotes, but I, I just I don't remember them. So no, that's fine. I that that's fine. I really appreciate what you've given me. Um, before we finish, I want to feel like we maybe glossed over the educational marketing stuff. As long as I'm talking to you, yeah, did, did, did um, you mention pilot? What else did you do there? Did you do anything with the the Dorset educational set tapes? Um, no, that wasn't my. That was a different part of the group. Um, what I did do was to commission the writing of a little booklet. I have it, but I don't have it in front of me. Uh, Atari for educators uh, that showed the way you could use computers in classrooms. Uh, and informal settings, uh, and it was a glossy Atari publication. Uh, I could scan it for you if you want to see it uh, yes, yes. Not that long. And uh, we, I was focused on, on showing how you could use, in this case, it was since I worked for Atari, it was Atari, but it didn't have to be Atari computers uh, in, in those kinds of ways. And uh, I can't remember, I think the main thing I, I brought to market, I mean, I actually wrote the first pilot user guide. I have a, it's this one, it's called the student pilot. Uh, this was, <laughs> I mean, there was also later on a, a, a true Atari pilot reference guide. Right, the pilot primer there. Yeah, and the, the demo programs guide, but this little guy uh, was all you know, cartoons and graphics mm -hmm. meant to uh, be easy to follow. I'll never forget, there's a picture of the Big Dipper in here on one of these pages that had to do with plotting things. And I was sitting in a hot tub with my wife in Seattle uh, at her brother's place, looking up at the stars, and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I got the Big Dipper backwards. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> Oops. Funny what you what you uh, remember, but um, yeah, that was an attempt to to, to say okay, uh, not everybody's going to want to learn how to program in BASIC, and there are there are other ways to get into computers for younger people, uh, younger children, uh, and particularly if if you, what you want to do is interactive dialogues, uh, pilot is made for that. So you know, setting up something where the computer asks a question, you respond, and you kind of start going back and forth is quite straightforward in Pilot. Uh, and they, since they added graphics processing commands to Pilot, it was also easy to, you know, draw a square, turn it, do that kind of stuff, kind of logo-like. Um, so that that was my emphasis in toy marketing, educational marketing. Um, my brother probably made the biggest difference because he was running a foundation from Atari, and his whole thing was to promote with money and support uh, and Atari computers, uh, educational uh, development in s real schools around the country. And he's got some really interesting success stories about that, not the least of which is my own high school back in Denver, uh, where, where he granted them a whole lab full of computers. Um, he could tell you more about the details. Excellent. But that wasn't really 
that, that's not marketing in the true sense of educational marketing. I mean, Atari, as, as in becoming a computer company, and particularly in the 80s when personal computers were just beginning to happen, and, uh, I can't remember when the IBM PC was first introduced, but, uh, you know, schools were trying to figure out what, what, what should we do with this, and that was the whole goal of the educational marketing department was to figure out it wasn't just uh, programming, it was also the idea of what kind of software could be used. And so there was, for example, some, I didn't have anything to do with Atari Lab, but uh, the sensors that were hooked into the Atari 800 through Atari Lab was another area that the educational marketing department had something to do with. The whole uh, speed reading thing that somebody, they did, uh, was, I forgot who they you know, contracted with to do the speed reading unit, but I have a copy of that around here somewhere. But, you know, for the Last year, I was only, I started Atari in 81, so basically it wasn't long after I did pilot that I, I moved into the special project, so I really didn't have that much to do with marketing after that. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. As I mentioned earlier, Bob came through with a massive amount of materials from the camps, all of which I've digitized and uploaded to the Internet Archive. Well, campers, our time at Atari Camp is at its end. This episode was months of work, and I'd like to thank everyone who helped. Bob Kahn, Paul Sommerfeld, Dave Dresden, Barry Champagne, and Peggy for saving her son's letters home, and Michael Current for his Atari History Timeline. If you somehow want a little more about Atari Camps, listen to Antic Interview episode number four, where Randy interviewed Chris Olson, whose father taught at an Atari Camp. If you went to an Atari Camp, either as a camper or a counselor, I want to hear from you. Maybe I'll do a follow-up episode next summer. Email Antic at antic at ataripodcast.com. Find us on Twitter at Atari Podcast. Show notes with links to a ton of material related to the Atari camps, much of it, which is online for the first time ever, is at ataripodcast.com. Have a great summer.